Good morning and afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to today's session, uh, Combating Microaggressions in the Workplace. Um, as many of you are aware, I am Max Smith. I'm the Communications Director, Director for 501C Services. A lot of you on today's uh, webinar already work with us in one of our many programs. For those of you who are just visiting, welcome. Uh, something real quick about us. Um, 501C services, we provide full service unemployment outsourcing programs and other services such as HR consultation to about 3,000 nonprofits across the country. Uh, here are some of our programs, the 501C Agencies Trust, uh, 501C HR services. Uh, so um, if you need us for anything, you know where you can find us. Um, I will go ahead and get uh, some housekeeping out of the way, and then we will hand our session off to our guest today, Stephanie. So real quick, uh, the veterans on our shows today understand how this works. Um, you are free to ask questions at any time. Uh, Stephanie and I will keep an eye on your questions and we will cover some of them as we go. And then we will find time at the end <clears throat> to try to answer any additional questions that you might have. Uh, in some of our preparation, Stephanie wanted us to be very cognizant that the, the subject matter might be sensitive for some people, but this is a safe space if you have a question, ask the question. Um, nobody can see your question but Stephanie and I, so you're safe in anonymity. And you know, if you have a question, you need to get it answered, so you should ask it. This is a safe, safe place to be today. Um, many of you are on uh, here for some uh, HR certification credits through either SHRM or HRCI. You know how that typically works. At the conclusion of our session, a survey will pop up. Just complete that survey for me. Let me know which credit you want, either or both, and I will send those to you hopefully this afternoon, but at the latest, probably tomorrow morning. And um, if you have to hop off and go to lunch or go to another meeting or hop on another Zoom, um, you'll get that copy of that survey by email later today as well, so you don't need to feel free. You have to hang around if you can't today's slide deck. Um, we will email that to you later today, but it is also already available in the handout section of the GoToWebinar browser. So you just uh, click the handouts. There'll be a PDF there. You can download it um, and save that for your, for your purposes or shared otherwise. And you'll also get a video copy of today's presentation later today as well. So we got you covered on the materials. We got you covered on the questions and your certification credits. And as I hand this off to Stephanie, I will let you all know that we will be uh, having a couple of leadership sessions in the months coming. Our first one starts next month on leading with empathy. Um, and we will conclude our year with a whole bunch of leadership sessions for you all. So look out for those emails and um, uh, we will hope to see you guys again later on. But for right now, I've handed it off to our friend today, uh, Stephanie Coverson from JAMA Pay um, Consulting, and she's going to talk to us about microaggressions. How are you doing this morning, Stephanie? Good, Matt. Thank you so much uh, for the warm introduction, um, and uh, good morning and afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephanie Coverson, uh, she, her, hers pronouns, um, and I'm the founder and principal of Jame Pay Consulting, um, which is an organization that partners with uh, employers looking to create uh, cultures uh, of belonging. And so I'm really excited uh, to be with y'all today about and uh, discuss uh, how to combat microaggressions in the workplace. So today, um, during our time together, we're going to uh, learn how to define um, and identify microaggressions, why it's everyone's responsibility to combat them, I'm going to give you some tools uh, to combat microaggressions and then also talk a little bit about microaggressions in the workplace um, so folks understand the impacts. So let's dive right into it. What are microaggressions? 
So microaggressions are these sort of everyday slights um, or snubs. They can be um, intentional or unintentional, um, but they communicate a hostile or derogatory message um, about or to the receiver. Um, and so psychiatrist uh, Dr. Chester M. Pierce uh, first coined the term microaggressions in the 70s to develop or to excuse me to describe the subtle insults and put downs that African Americans experience regularly. But since the 70s, uh, psychologists have since expanded the definition of microaggressions. Um, um, to uh, include behavior directed towards any historically marginalized group. Um, there is a, a, a scope of work in terms of researching the impact of microaggressions, and we're finding that the cumulative effect of them um, can lead to harmful and negative health, social, uh, and emotional distress. And uh, I'd like to uh, just take a minute to talk about this, this prefix of micro. And so we think of micro as tiny or small. Um, and microaggressions are neither one of those things. And so uh, the term or the prefix micro in this context Think of it as sort of the difference between macro and microeconomics, uh, as an example. Um, still both very important. Um, and when we're talking about microaggressions, we're talking about sort of drilling down into those uh, interpersonal um, interactions or persons operating on behalf of systems um uh to commit microaggressions so for example if i am waiting in line in a bank and um and so the the bank attendant is helping other folks in front of me um and i am a person of color the the folks in front of me um, appear to be white identifying and so if the teller doesn't ask the three people in front of me, for example, for identification, and then they get to me and they ask to see ID to, to do a transaction, um, that can convey the message, um, you know, that uh, uh, as a person of color, um, they have to take further action to uh, to scrutinize me more more highly because um, uh, conveying this uh, unintentional message uh, that I'm up to no good, I'm out to, uh, I don't know, check cashing fraud or sort of any of those kinds of things. So that's an example how microaggression can show up um, in an interpersonal act action on behalf of an organization, right? That person is doing their job and the microaggression is showing up in the job. Um, so those cumul cumulative effects, I encourage to folks to um, think of them, I used to call them death by paper cut. So one paper cut in and of itself, you know, those are very hurtful and sort of over time it heals and, and it's done. But microaggressions are, you know, sort of those tens of thousands of paper cuts over time. Okay, so there are three types of uh, microaggressions. The first are microassaults. Um, those are intentional. Uh, they're conscious. Um, they're meant to cause harm or distress. And and uh, this is uh, these are uh, identity based. These are intentional. Um, and so think of uh, slurs and epithets. A physical uh, or verbal assault, uh, attempted assault, destruction of property, uh, road rage, um, other uh, physically threatening um, behavior, all based on a person's uh, 
uh, the targeted person's identity. And then micro insults are those uh, unconscious uh, uh, messages that convey uh, demeaning or uh, rude behavior. And because they're unconscious, they are the result of the messages that we have all received um, over the years uh, from media, uh, from uh, education, government, family, friends, um, even our even our upbringing. Um, and so as a result of those unconscious messages that we all receive, not just some of us, um, sometimes we say um, or do things that unconsciously conveys um, a, a rude or demeaning message about someone's identity. Micro invalidations are also a form of uh, microaggressions. And these are comments and behaviors that nullify an individual's lived experience. And again, because they're unconscious, they are the result of the messages we've received, um, again, in uh, throughout our lives um, from various uh, sources of information and experiences. So here's an opportunity, first opportunity to sound off. Uh, I'd love to hear from folks, um, you can drop this in the chat, if this scenario here is a micro assault, a micro insult, or a micro invalidation. And the scenario is this, Andrea asks Michael, who identifies as Asian, where are you from? He replies, Portland, Oregon. And Andrea follows up, Hmm, so where is your family from? So I'd love to hear from you. Um, and you can again drop it in the chat. Um, is this a micro assault? So a conscious derogatory message um, or action meant to cause distress to the targeted person? It is, is it a micro insult? Uh, which conveys a rude or demeaning message about uh, the, the target's identity, or a micro-invalidation, um, something that nullifies um, a historically marginalized uh, person's lived experience. So they're coming in, uh, Stephanie, and it, there seems to be a split between invalidation and insult. Yes, yes. So this one here is uh, a micro insult, and the message is conveying that Michael does not belong, um, is uh, othering, and questioning whether he is really from Portland, Oregon, um, AKA if he's really uh, a US citizen or did he uh, you know, come from another country? And so again, as we all know, just because one identifies as Asian does not mean that uh, they are not uh, a U.S. citizen, not uh, born here, uh, not acculturated here, sort of all of those things. And, and so uh, typically uh, we would not ask someone um, the follow-up question, right, of where is your family from? Or um, another way that sometimes this is phrased is, no, where are you really from? And so it is that conveying of that message uh, that Michael doesn't belong.
All right, sound off number two. Vanessa, who identifies as a woman, tells Joe, whenever I try to share an idea at a team meeting, the other men in the room interrupt and talk over me. Joe tells Vanessa, you are being too sensitive and just need to toughen up. What do you think? Is this a microaggression, a micro insult, or a micro invalidation? They're still coming in, Stephanie, but uh, the consensus seems to be invalidation on this one. That is correct. Absolutely. It's a micro invalidation. So it is negating uh, Vanessa's experience, lived experience and treatment um, as a woman. And uh, it is also, in a sense, um, turning that blame onto her that when folks talk over her, she needs to do something about it or she just needs to uh, continue to sort of flow with that experience. Um, so it is, it is uh, extremely um, invalidation. She could be receiving it very much as uh, extremely invalidating. And there is um, a whole body of work um, about uh, women um, who uh, attempt to present ideas, thoughts, um, speak up um, in workplace settings are more likely to be um, interrupted and talked over um, than men are. Um, so uh, thank you for those who uh, shared, uh, put it in the chat in terms of this particular sound off. We've got one more. Okay. Susan excitedly runs up to Jason, who identifies as Black, and says, oh my goodness, how do you make your hair do that? And then grabs one of Jason's locks and begins to closely examine it. Micro-assault, micro-insult, or micro-invalidation? Stephanie, I'm seeing nothing but micro assaults from our audience. Okay. So this one is a little tricky, right? Because touching somebody, um, someone without their consent could be um, a assault, physical um, assault. Um, this message can also convey um, a micro insult. Um, that Jason's hair is quote unquote weird or uh, abnormal. Um, it can also convey that touching his hair uh, without his permission, that can convey that Jason is uh, a, a person for, or his person um, is for Susan's uh, curiosity and entertainment. It can also convey uh, that Susan is disrespectful of uh, Jason's um, agency as an individual. And there is uh, also, um, this also can be received as uh, uh, Susan petting Jason, right? And so we pet pets, we pet animals. Um, and so it can be a very um, extremely derogatory um, message, um, very much a derogatory um, insult. Um, so thank you for uh, those who chimed in to the chat um, to sound off on uh, these three scenarios. So now that we've talked a little bit about what microaggressions are and the different categories, um, why is it important to um, 
combat these? I mean, you know, the whole saying of what sticks and stones may break your bones, but names will never hurt you. Well, we're learning that names and actions and behaviors do hurt. Um, and so again, there's a whole body of work uh, around the impacts of microaggressions on uh, uh, historically marginalized communities, uh, individuals of from historically marginalized uh, uh, communities. And microaggressions communicate the message that someone doesn't belong or that they're not welcome. And so this runs contrary, right, to many employers who are striving to recruit and hire um, a diverse workforce. But it's difficult to retain employees when the work environment um, and, and some folks in the work environment may be conveying messages that certain employees are not valued and don't belong there. Uh, researchers um, in roughly 2000, 2017 at Columbia University found for experience the experience of racism, even through microaggressions, can result in traumatic stress. Um, and stress is linked to negative mental health outcomes such as depression, anger, uh, physical illness, uh, and reactions, um, avoiding uh, social situations, uh, hypervigilance, and even low self-esteem. And so microaggressions, again, don't let the micro fool you. They can be very um, significant and very harmful um, to the individuals who are targeted by them. It's also important to convey microaggressions because when witnessing bias-based behavior and microaggressions um, directed toward someone else is a microaggression. Um, because it is, in a sense, uh, co-signing uh, that, that statement. Um, because silence can convey agreement. One of the analogies that I like to uh, invite people to consider is uh, sitting in traffic, you know, so we're in our cars somewhere, we're stuck in traffic, and we're like, oh my gosh, this traffic is horrible. This is, you know, the state needs to do this. The city needs to do that. This is ridiculous. I'm going to be late. But we're in the car. We're in our car. So we are the traffic, right? So I say that to say that we're all responsible for creating a workplace culture of inclusion and belonging. And so it's not someone else's job over here. It's not just on these folks over there to be responsible for creating the workplace um, that we want to see. Uh, it's also important to note that if a person has been made aware that their comments and actions are microaggressions and they continue to behave in the same way, this behavior is no longer based in implicit bias it becomes explicit bias. And so again, we are all responsible for creating the workplace culture uh, that we want to see and communicates this right message of belonging um, so that people can feel supported to come to work and do their best work. So what are some tools? to combat microaggressions in the workplace. Um, I invite folks to be an upstander. And so uh, a bystander watches things happen. An upstander interrupts. And so I invite folks to speak out against bias-based behaviors and microaggressions when you witness them. And I invite folks to speak out 
regardless of whether you share that same historically marginalized identity. Because again, everyone is responsible um, for creating a culture of inclusion. For example, I don't have to be a person with a disability to object to bias-based behaviors and microaggressions against people with disabilities. I can still express, for example, discomfort, shock, embarrassment. Um, and so when we are uh, being an upstander and interrupting microaggressions when we witness them, um, I encourage folks to communicate how the language made you feel, not assuming that it made the person targeted, not assuming um, how the comment made the targeted person feel. Um, I encourage folks to avoid speaking for another person because that in and of itself can be tokenizing and patronizing. I encourage folks um, as another tool to combat microaggressions in the workplace consider using um, a spirit of inquiry or chasing curiosity um, because that can open the door for more conversation um, about how the statements or actions um, are microaggressive and rooted in bias. Um, and so leading with something like, can you say more uh, about what you meant by fill in the blank? Um, or ask questions uh, like what led you to say X, uh, believe Y or do Z. Um, and so that allows us to have the conversation without um, shaming an individual um, because we want folks to hear the message. Um, and again, uh, many times unconscious uh, microaggressions are unconscious behaviors. Um, another tool that uh, can be used is to discuss the intent versus the impact. So again, since most times microaggressions are based in implicit bi bias, that means that folks might not be aware that their actions were harmful. Um, so an example here, while you may not have intended to convey this, uh, your statement may send the message that uh, fill in the blank and I'm really uncomfortable uh, with that or I am not okay with that. And so also when we discuss intent and impact, it's important to remember that even if it was unconscious or unintentional, harm still occurred. And so it is important to focus on the impact. A couple of more tools. If a comment or behavior um, of yours is brought to your attention as a microaggression or bias uh, based, receive that gift of feedback without defensiveness and a commitment to do better and then follow through. Um, another analogy that I like to use is um, the uncontrolled intersection. Um, you know, you're driving, down the street on your way to wherever um, and for whatever reason you go through the intersection um, and you hit someone you're not going to or I hope that one doesn't get out of their vehicle and say you know I didn't mean to hit you the sun was in my eyes I didn't see the stop sign um, you know, I was just only trying to go to the grocery store. Um, hopefully the first response is to center, right? Focus on the impact. Oh my goodness, are you okay? Um, 
And so when we focus on the intent of the words or the actions or, or what happened, we lose sight of the impact and that harm. Um, the, the comments were harmful. Um, and so again, it's important to focus on the impact. Um, and then finally, take responsibility for your learning. And so sometimes it might be tempting to say, well, you know, the next time I do something microaggressive or the next time that um, I make a comment that is, I don't know, offensive to women, um, let me know. It is not other folks' responsibility um, to point out and or to continuously monitor us and point out um, if uh, our actions or behaviors um, are rooted in um, implicit um, bias or our microaggressions. Um, it's important to take responsibility for our own learning. Um, for example, if I want to learn how to ski, I have to go to the mountain and, and put some skis on and, and learn how to do that. I cannot expect folks to ski down the mountain on my behalf and then now I'm an expert skier. Um, and so leaning into this, um, this learning is very important. Accountability is a is a tool to uh, to combat microaggressions in the workplace because again, once individuals uh, an individual has been advised that their behavior or statements are microaggressions or bias based, if they continue to repeat those behaviors, then they're no longer unconscious and they actually become explicit bias. So how can um, unconscious bias and microaggressions, how do they impact the workplace if they continue to be or continue to go unaddressed? Um, they can negatively impact the mental and physical health of the recipients of those microaggressions. Uh, they can interrupt effective team building and collaboration. Uh, they can impede an organization's ability to uh, uh, attract and retain talented individuals. Um, for example, according to a September 2020 survey from Glassdoor, 76% of employees and job seekers said a diverse workforce was important when evaluating companies um, and job offers. Nearly half of Black and Hispanic employees and job seekers said they had quit their job after witnessing or experience, experiencing discrimination at work. And 37% of employees and job seekers said they wouldn't apply to a company that had negative satisfaction ratings among people of color. And so this means that, um, that we are, um, as employers, um, going to continue to have a revolving door that keeps revolving if we are not ensuring that we are creating um, a culture of belonging, if we are uh, not creating a workplace uh, where folks do not feel compelled to hide or minimize core aspects of their identities. Um, and also um, uh, feeling as though folks have to hide or minimize core aspects of their identities to promote or achieve success um, 
in the workplace. Unaddressed microaggressions can also lower employee engagement and satisfaction. Um, there's a whole body of work around uh, uh, millennials, Gen Y, and Gen Z um, that talk about how these generations of folks in the workforce, no matter their uh, race, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, um, et cetera, are uh, expecting uh, workplaces uh, that are uh, diverse and multicultural and where uh, employers are creating and fostering uh, this culture of belonging. And so we have folks um, that are really uh, working to or expecting um, employers uh, to walk their talk. And so again, uh, creating these, these work environments uh, where folks um, feel as though uh, they belong, uh, that they are valued, um, and do not have, um, do not feel as though they are being subjected to, I would say, sort of a steady diet um, of uh, microaggressions and uh, uh, bias-based incidents um, in the workplace. And finally, um, unaddressed microaggressions can cause employees to become unwilling uh, to speak up in meetings and take professional risks. Um, because uh, particularly um, in work environments where uh, folks are subjected to um, sort of ongoing microaggressive behavior, um, it can cause folks to question themselves, uh, question their skills, their uh, abilities, whether or not, um, even if they bring this information forward, um, will it be heard, um, will it be received? And so employers can lose out um, on uh, great ideas um, because folks um, are feeling as though they can't speak up. Uh, one last piece on um, the impact of microaggressions. As employers are starting to trend towards either uh, returning to the workplace full time or having a flexible work schedule where folks um, come into uh, the office a few days a week and then work from home a few days a week. Um, uh, we have uh, some polling. Um, the last one that I read, uh, only 3% of uh, Black employees polled um, are excited to return to the workplace versus 21% of folks who identify as white. And part of the uh, supposition around that is that if I am in my house and my, if I am in my place where I am comfortable um, and have a sense of uh, psychological safety, um, it's more difficult it's more challenging um, to experience microaggressions right in the break room or in those interpersonal um, uh, actions if I'm not in the workplace. And so there is a hesitancy, um, a trend of hesitancy um, uh, to return to the workplace because working remotely um, provided employees um, that were experiencing um, microaggressions 
a relief or a reduction from them. All righty. So I invite you to remember uh, microaggressions negatively impact the recipients um, of them. It is everyone's responsibility to create a culture of belonging, um, no matter an individual's work title, no matter um, uh, whether or not um, someone sits on employee committees or don't or works on the first floor versus the third floor, it doesn't matter. We all have some level of responsibility to create a culture of belonging. Um, I invite people to remember that silence conveys agreement. Um, and uh, it's important to center the impact of microaggressions instead of focusing on the intent. It's critical that we work to develop cultural self-awareness and humility and to take responsibility uh, for our own learning. All right, so I would love to hear what questions uh, you have about uh, combating microaggressions in the workplace. And again, um, please feel free to um, ask your questions in the chat. Um, it is confidential and only Mac will see them. So we have a couple already. Um, and I'll just go ahead and start. We'll just do as many as we have time for. Um, Stephanie, can you kind of elaborate or expand on a, your definition of the difference between a microaggression and just discrimination and or harassment? Absolutely, great questions. So first of all, microaggressions um, uh, can be a form of harassment if, um, you know, it is interrupted and uh, an individual is told um, or should have known that that behavior was uh, microaggressive um, on the basis of someone's identity and they continued at it. Um, and uh, with uh, whether a work environment um, where it's uh, straight up harassment um, or uh, discrimination, uh, microaggressions um, can um, over time if they continue and depending on um, the severity and pervasiveness um, can be cited as evidence of harassment or discrimination. Great. Um, there's a couple of questions about um, how to handle a microaggression when you observe it. And perhaps you could provide a little bit more insight on, you know, when do you call somebody out? Do you do it right then and there? Do you do it at a more private time? Um, you, covered it, uh, you covered it a little bit in your presentation. So could you expand on that a little bit for the observers of microaggressions and your recommendations about how they should um, handle that? Yes. Um, I would say that it, it depends on the situation. And frankly, it also depends on us. Um, and so sometimes um, it is appropriate to uh, call out the behavior um, that we're seeing in the moment. Um, uh, and for an example, um, uh, open the front door is uh, a framework so uh, that you can use for addressing um, 
microaggressions um, in the workplace. Um, as an example, um, I could say something like, um, uh, when we talk, uh, or when I hear comments such as uh, telling someone that they are a credit to their race, it's a common microaggression, um, I think that that conveys um, a message that folks from that uh, rate, it generalizes folks um, of that racial identity um, are uh, less than. I feel uncomfortable that that might be the message received. Um, and so I hope in the future that uh, we will refrain from doing X, Y, and Z. And so you're sharing the observation, you're telling folks what you think about the observation, you're telling them how the action made them feel or you feel, and in the future, this is what you would like to see done differently. Um, I also advise folks um, that I work with that it's okay to go back to, to that incident. Um, like if you're in a meeting space and someone says something and in your mind, you're like, oh my goodness, I cannot believe that I just heard this. Um, and so you might take some time to collect your thoughts and think about what you're going to say and then say, I know we moved past agenda item A, uh, but after a little reflection, I would like to go back to that. I would like to go back to that agenda item because I have one more thought. And then utilize that framework around um, that I shared with uh, open the front door. Sometimes it might be uh, more appropriate to uh speak with someone one-on-one -on -one, um about the the behavior or action that we observed so for whatever reason um we can't intervene in the moment or the environment is not conducive for us to intervene in the moment and it could be as simple as hey stephanie um I have some thoughts about um, the conversation that we had earlier this week or what we discussed at the meeting earlier this week. I'd love to get some time on your calendar and connect with you. Sometimes uh, we may not be sure something is a microaggression, right? But it just didn't, just something about the interaction that we witnessed or what was said, um, particularly if um, uh, the targeted person um, is in the room um, or uh, the, the reference being made about a particular uh, historically marginalized group, um, someone who identifies as a part of that group uh, may be in the room. It could be having a conversation with that person separately saying, you know, when Stephanie said X, I feel really uncomfortable about it. Here's why. I think it's a microaggression. Here's why. I wanted to check in with you. Um, and they may um, open up to, to us or they may not, um, but if they heard uh, the same statement um, as a microaggression, then the question can be, how can I support you, right? Um, so 
I am happy to go with you to um, HR. I'm happy to write a statement. I'm happy to, you know, talk with um, your manager, you, you know, us together. I'm happy to go with you um, and have that conversation, share what I saw um, so that you are being an upstander kind of versus a by this bystander that you saw this thing happen. Um, and just saying, I saw this thing happen and I'm really sorry that this happened to you. Um, because then the question becomes like, why, why was I, um, why was I subjected to this by myself? So that could be further harming, if that makes sense. Right. So there's been a, um, there, I just want our audience to know that this next question, um, there's, there's a couple of them around this topic but it kind of stays right where we're at. So we have a lot of non, all of our folks here are nonprofits and there's a couple of questions about dealing with board members or large donors who commit microaggressions. So you've just kind of laid out, you know, some advice about how to handle them in the workplace and how sensitive it can be. Would you alter any of that for a large donor or board members, you know, somebody who has, uh, a lot of say in the uh, outcomes at a at an organization if those individuals are committing microaggressions on a regular basis yeah so i think that that is a i think that's a timely question and many folks um that is a concern to many folks um and uh Several of the clients that I have worked with uh, found it effective to um, get their um, management team involved, so their direct, uh, like their direct manager, um, and and sort of on up the chain to kind of have those conversations about how. Uh, the organization could and should respond to this um, because they're absolutely right. Is this power differential? And you wonder, right, um, or there's some concern around, um, uh, you know, do I say this here? And so there's this uh, this this power differential and concern about whether or not um, whether or not you will be heard, and I think it's important to get your uh, your direct manager involved, sort of all the way up to the the executive director um, and the and or the CEO involved, um, because it is important to have those conversations. Um, particularly with um, board members, because uh, our efforts around creating um, these inclusive workplaces, um, the board is an Im imperative customer um, around that. And I do, uh, I do recommend to clients uh, that I work with to have those conversations. And those conversations can be very challenging. Those conversations can be very uncomfortable. Um, and also, organizations also want board members that are in uh, alignment um, with their work um, in creating more equitable and inclusive workplaces. And so it's also imperative to bring to bring those board members um, along in that uh, in that journey and the work that organizations are doing to move uh, their DEI um, and anti-racism goals forward. Excellent. Um, yeah, so there's a little bit of um, <clears throat> follow-up questions on that, but I want to move on to another question. Um, early on in, in the program, you talked about oftentimes microaggressions can be targeted at marginalized communities or 
most often are. Can you talk about when a microaggression might be targeted towards a not marginalized community, such as perhaps a, 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 perhaps a Hispanic uh, microaggression towards uh, a white individual? Can you talk about, does that change the dynamic because one's marginalized and one's not, or does it, it not matter? Um, so microaggressions um, talk about um, uh, derogatory and demeaning behavior towards folks from historically marginalized communities. And so we all have identities that are, um, that can be, um, or that are marginalized. Right. So, um, for example, um, I am a black woman. That is, a, is that is an identity that has been historically marginalized. Right. But I am also um, uh, heterosexual. I am also Christian. Um, I am also uh, uh, not a person with a disability. So I do have dominant identities, right? And so when we're talking about microaggressions, we are talking about comments, rude, demeaning comments that are uh, conveyed to folks from historically marginalized communities. Okay, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. And as we wrap up here, um, how would you recommend the HR department handle, formally handle microaggressions? You know, if there's, if there's discrimination or whatnot, there's a lot of, you know, investigations that people are more traditionally used to. Uh, with of the microaggression, would you recommend a, a typical standard HR investigation and follow-up? Or is there something nuanced that you think needs to be included as well? That's a great question. Thank you for raising it. So first, I think similar to other um, sort of non-discrimination policies and requirements that employees need to be aware of what microaggressions are. So I think, uh, similar to the training that we would do for sexual harassment, uh, for non-discrimination. Um, I believe that microaggressions should absolutely be addressed in those uh, trainings, in HR policies, et cetera. Um, because again, many times these are unconscious. Right, but similar to um, other aspects of uh, identity and appropriate behavior and conduct in the workplace, um, we learned, um, for example, that um, uh, we we learned, for example, uh, how we are uh, supposed to interact and work with um, folks you know, around us um, through the trainings and, and procedures and such. Um, and so this is uh, an addition to that, right? That we need to ensure that, I guess not just employees, vendors, volunteers, sort of all of the different folks um, that may uh, come into our workplace, be a part of our workplace. Um, that microaggressions are not okay. And uh, yes, I do believe um, in short that, um, that if there are allegations um, of uh, inappropriate and harassing behavior is occurring in the workplace and an employee is bringing forward microaggressions as evidence um, or incidents that occur that are creating um, 
an unwelcoming work environment, a hostile work environment that yes, they need to be investigated um, and appropriate action taken. Great, great. Thank you for that clarification. And just our last question before everybody hops off here. Um, if folks need training in the workplace, training for their boards, uh, how can they, how, what would you recommend they do? Um, so I think the first conversation um, is with the board, right? Um, so it's important um, for uh, board members uh, to be willing um, and uh, willing to lean into these conversations, willing to, uh, to take the training um, or learning sessions um, or coaching, sort of whatever those things are. Um, I think that it is important uh, for boards to have similar learning sessions to understand um, what the organization is trying to do around creating equitable and inclusive workplaces. Um, so uh, particularly around maybe a new board member orientation or uh, around the board retreat. Um, you know, those are great times to um, create, I think, uh, either learning opportunities or plenary sessions for as folks are planning their board member year. Um, what work um, are we going to be doing around um, diversity, equity, inclusion? How are we going to be supporting um, the organization in their uh, uh, DEI strategies and initiatives. Um, and then there are, uh, there are consulting firms and organizations that can very specifically work with board members um, around uh, coaching, around uh, implementing and operationalizing uh, uh, this work um, into their duty as board members. Great. Well, Stephanie, we are out of time. Um, thank you so much for being here uh, and helping us out with this um, topic. Um, and thanks everybody for all your input uh, online. We got a lot of great and wonderful questions. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure to spend some time with you this morning um, and feel free to stay connected. Um, feel free to send me an email if you have questions. Um, uh, and thank you for joining me today. Thank you for inviting me, Mac. Absolutely. We'll do this again very soon. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye.